Okay, so this is uh, carrying on with the theme that uh, we can make atoms cold. Uh, how do we manipulate the one step cold? So we've uh, dedicated some time to the electric dipole potential. So now I'm going to spend uh, this session telling you about uh, magnetic dipole uh, interactions. Uh, quick overview of the whole field, and then specifically to an experiment uh, I've been working on in Durham. So the idea is we're going to uh, interact cold atoms with magnetic nanowires. So this is an interdisciplinary multi-site uh, project funded by EPSRC. So uh, these are the characters involved in Durham, the other characters involved in Sheffield. Uh, our expertise uh, is cold atoms, their expertise is magnetic nanowires. Uh, I think we've just about got enough overlap to have a conversation now after many years. Um, so what am I going to tell you about? So I'll give a quick overview of uh, yeah, the properties of atoms in magnetic field. And we use these type of potentials. Uh, and I assume uh, that you, uh, like me four years ago, had never heard of nanowires potentially or domain walls. So I'll give a very, very quick introduction to what these devices are and why they're going to be useful for us. Then I'll tell you about experiments we've been doing, uh, making the magnetic mirror for atoms and atom traps, uh, and then depending on time, uh, where we are and where we might be in the future. Um, what we'd like to do. So how do we manipulate, uh, what is the force? So we've seen the light force, what is the force that uh, allows us to manipulate magnetic atoms? And it's the stern gerlach force. So Everyone probably was introduced to the magnetic quantum number by thinking these experiments with beams of uh, atoms moving along field gradients causing uh, deflection. So that's essentially what we use. So the potential of a paramagnetic atom with magnetic double moment mu in the static field B is minus mu dot. So it literally is just like a little bar magnet. So Classically, you can think of the magnetic moment as uh, processing around B. Uh, quantum mechanically, that's the same statement as that the motion is adiabatic, and that we don't change the state. So this projection is constant, and that is the magnetic quantum. So provided, so if there are regions in space where B changes, and there have to be, there are gradients, it's going to be like this. If my atom is moving sufficiently slowly that as it moves through space and B changes, but essentially it processes, it keeps its projection, then all I really worry about is the magnitude of the magnetic field. The vector nature of that equation actually then turns into a scale. And that makes everything much, much easier to deal with. And then you can essentially factor out the magnetic moment and the force is given by the gradient of the magnitude of the so in this talk, I'm going to be concentrating a lot on the magnitude of the magnetic field because that essentially uh, gives me the potential that the cold atoms care about. So this adiabatic following actually works really well when the atoms are moving really slowly. And we've already seen that we can reduce the uh, kinetic energy of atoms by six orders of magnitude. So making them move really slowly is actually easy. So what might a trap look like for cold atoms? So imagine that I've got some series of conductors. I've made a magnetic field profile. Uh, we'll see exactly how this works on two sides. It looks like that. So it's a bowl. So the magnetic field um, modulus has a minimum. And the interaction energy uh, of an atom in a magnetic field is its magnetic quantum number, the lambda factor, the ball magneton, and B. And if I make so these are all positive. If I make these positive, it means that the potential the atom sees is basically just a map of that uh, B. So that's clearly going to be a trap for weak field seeking atoms. So if I place an atom in the middle of that potential, it might harmonically oscillate around there and stay in that region. So weak field seeking states are ones where MF is positive. I could change the orientation of the magnetic quantum number of the atom. So essentially you do that by using polarized light. It's the polarization of the light that allows you to change this. And if I made this negative, I'm going to call those strong field seeking states because essentially 
the potential they see is this thing uh, inverted. So they would clearly uh, run away from the center and want to get out to uh, as large a value of P as possible to minimize their energy. So we don't track these, we track the other ones. And for rubidium, which is the atom most of us use, uh, there are two quantum F quantum numbers in the ground state, so there's all those different NF quantum states, but there are three of them uh, that are exactly what we want. They have MFGF positive, that allows us to track them. <coughs> Selecting which one of those we have is also easy, all you have to do is control the um, polarization. Effect. So, how might I make some kind of trap? So the uh, first trap people developed was a quadrupole trap. So it's essentially a pair of coils with uh, currents in opposite directions, uh, separated by L diameter D. So from symmetry, the field in the center is clearly going to be zero. And then as I get closer to either of those coils, the field is going to increase. And in fact, the vector nature of the field is fairly simple. If you expand the field close to the center, B prime is a gradient, so if I move along X, the field increases linearly with X. If I move along Y, the field increases linearly with Y. And if I move along Z, it also increases linearly uh, over the opposite side and a factor of two to um, make sure maximum experience. So this gives me a potential of zero at the center, and then whichever direction I go in, the magnitude of the field goes up, so that's a trap. So it's the simplest possible trap because it has two coils and we make a very, very simple field. Uh, I didn't actually mention this in the last talk. But when we make atoms coiled with laser beams, one issue is the atoms slowly walk to the end of the laser beam and fall out. So we tend to use magnetic coils to realize something known as a very neat trap to trap to help push them back. So on your experiment, you probably have already got a pair of these coils sat there already, so that's why they were used extensively in the early days of magnetic trapping. Essentially, they were part of the apparatus already. Uh, the big difference, sorry, the uh, difficulty is this. They have B is zero at the center, so X, Y, Z is zero, B is zero. Why is that a problem? So I told you that the magnetic moment has to follow the magnetic field. If the magnetic field disappears, the magnetic moment has nothing to latch on to. So I could have been in a weak field state instead. If I get into a region of space where there is no field, I could then latch onto another field line and come out as a strong field seeking state and run out of So what is found experimentally is you load a trap like this. The atoms at the center lose their orientation in the forward. And that's bad because it limits the lifetime. And it's doubly bad because the atoms at the center tend to be the cold ones. So now you've got an anti-evaporation mechanism. You tend to lose the ones you're most interested in. The ones that are sloshing round don't spend long of time in the middle. So it's really bad. So the B is zero is a problem that has to be circumvented uh, for most experiments. So then people invented uh, this technique, top dropping. The top is the uh, acronym of time average orbiting potential. So I'm just going to do this for a second. So with that pair of coins, we get that very simple field. If I add an external constant field along x, say, this field just shifts along. So I get the same shape, and it's just shifted along. If I add a constant field along y, I get the same shape, and it's just shifted along. And the idea of this time average orbiting potential is in one direction, I will add a field which varies as cos over t. In the other direction, I will add a field that varies a sine omega t. So the location of the zero now goes around in a circle. So a snapshot of this at any given time would give me my quadrupole field. But the atoms don't actually care about that. They see the time average of this potential. And if you do the time average of that, it has a non-zero minimum. So that's great because it means atoms won't then lose their orientation and they'll live in this trap for much longer. So it circumvents the B0. Um, so uh, you have to lose something. What you lose is uh, this trap is very, very tight, which means the uh, magnetic field varies quickly in space, which gives you high frequencies. And we like high frequencies. That allows us to manipulate it. When you do this time averaging, 
potential bowl you get tends to be much more shallow or, or sloppy. So the Athens State edge is also in there. So we reduce the trap frequencies. There's another way of making uh, harmonic traps with non-zero minimum. So this came from plasma physics from about 50 years ago. You have these four current bars, which carry the same current magnitude, but um, opposite direction from neighboring bars. And then you have these error coils that pinch what happens in the middle. And if you do a vector expansion of that, uh, then eventually uh, you get the result that you get a finite minimum and you get harmonic trapping in all three dimensions. So there are radial frequencies, axial frequencies, they're all harmonic. Trap frequency scales as it's basically the square root of the curvature. So the second derivative of the field with respect to distance tells you how fast that is oscillate through this trap. And clearly, what you want are very high trap frequencies. And to make very high trap frequencies, there seems to be an obvious solution, which is if we make the length scale over which things vary very small, that number will <coughs> very high. So that's a clue as to why nano magnets are going to come into this talk. Is there. Make the length scale short, the trap frequencies can get large. So in atomic physics, these traps tend to be known as uh, Yoffe Pritchard. So Yoffe was the um, plasma physicist, and Pritchard was the atomic physicist who realized we could use these things. So this is a uh, picture from uh, my colleagues at Durham who actually built one of these for their state of the art experiment. So to give you a sense of scale, that's about 20 centimeters. You need a huge amount of copper. You have to pulse through a large amount of current in order to make any kind of macroscopic trap. So that copper, uh, you can't be see, depending on where you are in the room, but basically it's square cross-action, not circular, so that you can pack in as much copper as possible. But it's also hollow, so that we flow water down the center to stop the thing from melting. So the power dissipated <coughs> in this is ginormous. So the particular geometry uh, that many groups adopt is known as a baseball. Um, because it, the pattern of the, of the uh, conductors does look a bit like the winding on a baseball. So you get these big corners on the outside and then you get this uh, inner uh, shape that looks a bit like four wires going in and out in and etc. Uh, they're very hard to actually assemble. Uh, there's some expansions of what the fields look like. Uh, there's an offset feeling which is non-zero, which is good, and then the next terms are Terms, so we don't get the linear terms and the trap frequencies again scale as these quantities and these are the second order derivatives. So a few years ago people realized so that's a macroscopic trap that you actually have to put outside your apparatus as it were and slide in your vacuum chamber into the middle of that coil. Some people realized that we might be far better off if we did the opposite. If we had small structures placed in vacuum, we brought the cold atoms into their vicinity. So cold atoms <coughs> close to surfaces. So it's a simple idea. Uh, so rather than traps realize with massive macroscopic files outside your vacuum chamber, why don't we use these micro traps inside the chamber? Uh, and there are, so the, uh, the device is typically uh, are called atom chips. And the same realize that um, uh, silicon chips manipulate the flow of electrons on an atom chip uh, you move around um, things. But there are two broad classes, current carrying wire devices, where you literally have small wires, <coughs> small currents, but because the atoms are close to them, you get large fields. Or Permanently magnetized surfaces. If you calculate what the current is for a permanent magnet, it's astronomically large, which means we can get larger things which allow us to manipulate these current atoms. So that's essentially what we're talking about. So that's a summary again of we have a trap. The trap frequency goes as the uh, square root of the curvature, and the field, if you're using current carrying wires, goes as the current, which means large fields and necessitates large current. So um, those large macroscopic traps. So the first um, Bose-Einstein condensate was realized with 
such a quarter of a mile. The typical land scales are centimeters, and then the question is easy where the tens of hertz. So we have this ten meter slosh around uh, at tens of hertz. Uh, so Ed Hines' group of Imperial, so we know them well. He realized ways of making uh, magnetic structures with 100 microns. In vacuum, when you get much higher drop frequencies, fortunately. Uh, uh, the Max Planck group, Ted Hench, the Nobel Prize winner, they also were the pioneers of these micro traps and atom chips. They had uh, length scales of the order of 50 microns and get approximately a kilohertz. Um, people have got hybrid traps that use a bit of current and a bit of permanent magnetism. Peter uh, Hanford in Australia uh, was prominent in this field. Again, 10 ish microns, and you get tens of kilohertz. And um, our idea. We would like to use nanowire traps where the length scales now come down to less than a micron and the trap frequencies then um, scale up corresponding. And if you're interested in this uh, atom chip field, I can recommend either this uh, wonderful review that I brought with Ed, uh, slightly depressing in the last section, uh, <coughs> or what we have Zimmerman. Um, um, <coughs> Cold atoms with nanowires. So, cold atoms we never do meet then, where do the nanowires come in? So, why might we want to go first then? So, that's some atoms. These are the nanowires that I'm going to introduce. Uh, how does this work? So, atoms are sensitive to field, they're little <coughs> nanowires. Nanowires, we're going to use those as a tunable source of magnetic field. What's the real motivation for all this? Active chips are great for manipulating atoms, but it's some kind of quantum structure we want to make. So if we think of them as qubits, we need to combine them, take an atom, and want to move them apart, move them together. The domain walls, which I'll discuss in a second in nanowires, are highly localized, so I can imagine trapping an atom at a very, very specific point. Clearly, we want to uh, build some kind of device that isn't just for a single atom, <coughs> as impressive as that is. If we had an array of atoms, then we could compute um, more powerful things. As this picture shows, uh, <coughs> matter, they just know how to make one thing and then copy it. So it's inherently scalable technology. <coughs> The nanowires are made from soft magnetic material, which actually allows us to reconfigure it. So previously, permanent magnetic chips, you made a structure <coughs> and you put it in your vacuum chamber, and that was it forever. Whereas we're hoping to, well, have in fact demonstrated that um, with these materials, we can reconfigure the chip externally after we've assembled it. Uh, and again, the point I've made many times already, the fact that the length scale is very short means that the magnetic field gradient of the stereo of course, is huge which also means that the trap frequencies uh, are going to be very, very large. So how would we interface all of them? Well, actually, yes. So, oops, nanowires, if you haven't come across a nanowire. So what is a magnetic nanowire? The hint really is in the name. It's a magnet where the characteristic dimensions are used in nanometers. So they can be as long as you want. They're typically 100 nanometers wide, 30 nanometers tall. They can then be written, you can make patterns, and they're deposited on either silicon or magnesium oxide. They're made of that material, iron 81, nickel 19, uh, permaloy, uh, it's really um, it's the chosen material for nanomagnetic skills. It's a ferromagnet. So you can lithographically pattern it. So you ask them to make something, and they can. Our colleagues at Sheffield do all the manufacturing and characterizing all the structures for us. And the thing about permaloy is because the, the dimensions are very short, essentially, if you ask, how do I minimize the energy? Where does the magnetic field want to point? Essentially, it wants to point along the magnet. So the magnetic field has two ground sets, if you will. Either all the magnets are in this direction, or all the magnets are in that. That minimizes the energy for this nanowire. However, it's possible to configure this the left part of the wire as magnetism pointing to the right. The right part of the wire as magnetism pointing to the left. <coughs> so 
somewhere they must meet. So this is known as a domain. That's a domain. In this region, that magnetism changes some. That's the domain wall. And the length scale of that, again, is nanometers. So we have domains, which are regions of aligned magnetization, and then the interface between domains is known as a domain wall. At the domain wall, the magnetic field can pop out of the substrate. That's exactly what we want, because then we can start imagining having patterns above these domain walls, and we can manipulate them from there. So that's a schematic from what the magnetic field looks like. So here, there's hardly any field emanating from that domain. On the right, there's hardly any magnetic fields emanating from that domain. Where they meet, field lines poke out, and we're going to trap and manipulate atoms in the system. And uh, some of, well, it is a schematic. Some alarm bells might be ringing. You might think, well, that, that looks a bit like a magnetic monopole. We're probably taught magnetic monopoles don't exist. Uh, so we'll leave that to the coffee time, time discussion. I'm going to say that actually pretty much is a magnetic monopole. So how do we uh, approximate the field from that device? We use the field from the monopole. So QM is the charge in the monopole, and then it's uh, by as well. And if you calculate what happens above the, uh, if you go sufficiently far away from the wire, that's an excellent approximation. And it's slightly closer in, there are some correction terms. Uh, we're going to look at two regimes where we can use this field. So this is my nano wire. Imagine I put the main wall there. This then radiates field. So from a single domain wall, we can do something. In fact, we're going to make nothing trap. And if I had an array of these monopoles or domain walls, this one's south and north, that's one north, etc. Then the field above that is a collective field, and we can use that to realize an atom mirror, uh, which is what we look at first, in fact. So those are the two distinct regimes we look at. We look at this one first. Uh, and if you want to know more about where this current monopole behavior comes from, um, we published that paper earlier this year. Um, with the, yeah, so How do I make an atom mirror? Uh, so you start off by writing serpentine wire. And then the black arrow shows that the uh, energy is minimized when the magnetization just follows this wire. Essentially, it has two states. <coughs> the ground state, which is the one I've depicted there, has a single domain, so there are no fields poking out anywhere. If I then apply a field up and down the plane of this board, I can make another, well, metastable state. So what happens there is if I apply a rather large field, I get a domain in this direction and a domain leaving from that point. So that looks like a south pole. Up here, I get this domain crashing into that domain, so I get a north pole. And then I get south north, south north, south north. So I get a periodic array of sources of field. So this wire now has many domain walls. In fact, I have a periodic array. So typically, the distances are Regions are going to be huge because I'm divided by a power Having made this array, can I reconfigure it? And the answer is yes. If I apply a more modest field, 200 counts back along the wire, then we annihilate these domains, and we have one big domain running along the wire, essentially. So we can toggle between this device having no emanating magnetic field and periodic arrays of magnetic fields by applying these two external fields after this device has been written and put into our vacuum chamber. Uh, that's a good place how we actually make the device there. So 
I call this an after mirror. Uh, so what is an after mirror? So an optical mirror is a device that light bounces off. An after mirror is a device from which atoms bounce. Uh, again, this is from the uh, wonderful uh, review. I work with ends. Why I go up? How do you make uh, an atom mirror? If you were to uh, get audio tape, which is what we were doing last century, and then video tape and floppy disks, in fact, any kind of magnetic um, recording media, and record in it a sinusoidal magnetization. So it's north, south, north, south. But rather than being discrete, as you go along the direction of the tape, it very sinusoidally. It turns out that for a finite thickness tape, uh, you can solve analytically what the magnetic fields are above and uh, in this medium. Uh, and the field lines look like these, beautiful sidewise, in fact. However, we're not actually particularly interested in the vector nature of the field. The atom only cares about the magnitude of the field. And if you can't get the magnitude of the field above this, it's much more simpler. It's exponentially decaying away from the substrate, and you get these flat potential surfaces. So now the trajectory of an atom coming into this thing is it'll bounce, by which I mean its vertical motion will be reversed and its parallel component of velocity to the surface will be conserved because the force, the stone Miller force, is now normal to the surface. So if I make a device with a force that's normal to the surface, then actually it's a mirror. So the ideal magnetic mirror would have sinusoidal variation and flat equipotential surfaces. So our nano wire array is going to have part of the characteristics of this, which allows us to think of it as a mirror. So in fact, if we calculate what happens above <coughs> our array, we also get this beautiful cycloid variation where this essentially exponential decay away from the substrate. The length scale is in all the order of what fractions of microns, which means the gradients are really large. However, we don't have a sinusoidal variation. Always tend to be north, south, north, south. So it's uh, discrete, which you can think of as then having higher Fourier components, which means they interfere. Uh, and the equipotential surfaces, which should be perfectly flat, tend to be corrugated. So we haven't made a terribly good mirror. So that's somehow a unit cell, if you want, of what the magnetic field looks like above <coughs> a part of our array, and then we copy that many, many, or tessellate that many, many, many times to give the atom mirror. So what you would like is for that equipotential surface to be perfectly flat, ours is slightly corrugated, and there are one or two regions on our mirror where there just isn't enough magnetic field. So if you drop an atom under that part, artistic impression uh, of what was on in our experiment. We have the substrate, we have these uh, domain walls, we can then turn on fields, sorry, we have a nano wire which have domains, we turn on fields which make north, south, north, south domain walls. These field lines then emanate from those uh, walls, they go back to their neighbors, and if you calculate what the magnetic potential looks like about half a micron above the substrate, you get this slightly corrugated equipotential surface, and then the red dots are the atoms we're about to. So how do you test the quality of an atom mirror? Uh, you can always spend some time to make cold atoms, and then you make a mirror, and all you do is literally drop them and see if they can work. So another schematic of what the experiment actually looks like. So we have these big coils, so there was a switch or a nano mirror. Uh, and with cold atoms, they're going to fall on ballistic trajectories. Some of them will miss the mirror, many of them will hit the mirror and then come back. And when they come back through with a laser beam that we shine in uh, to image them, to make pictures, and also measure uh, how many there are at any given time. So we have um, various optical <coughs> components to combine the lens, uh, the light, sorry. We use a cylindrical lens to focus down into a tiny sheet. So we get information in a plane about the atomic motion. Uh, we have various optical components that allow us to do this in mirrors and lenses. We can
how that light can afford the diode from the fluorescence of the atoms when they go through this light. Uh, and um, to show that you're in this game, you have to have this at Heinz by any of this. As soon as you make an atom mirror, you then have to take a sequence of photos of that that's falling. So the first part of the mirror, uh, sorry, the first part of the movie is incredibly dull because it's the same as that. Uh, we will see things falling down at the rate of 9.81 meters per second squared. There are much, much cheaper ways of measuring energy than in that. Uh, however, the second part of the mirror um. of the experiment, uh, the mirror has been engaged, so the substrate is 5 millimeters, the atom mirror is 2 millimeters. Some of these atoms miss, others <coughs> will hit this region, and if it were a mirror, you would then expect to see them bounce back. So we see a slightly diffuse uh, atomic cloud uh, which clearly shows that the atoms have interacted with the slightly corrugated uh, potential made by the atomic uh, on this job. So to try and be slightly more scientific and quantitative about it, we, I mean these are some stills. So just to give you the numbers again, we drop them from a centimetre. Uh, substrates 5 millimetres across, the atom chip is 2 millimetres across. You can probably just like see the that uh, sequence that increases in the depth of these seconds, but the centre of that cloud is on a parabolic trajectory. And then we lose some of the atoms, which is why the signal to noise ratio um, degrades. And then you see the atoms coming back up from the trajectory being squashed up at the top. And clearly demonstrating that this thing is uh, an atom Actually, the, uh, to bring back a point from my first talk, uh, the stern Gerlach force has clearly been known about since 1920, so why weren't people making atom mirrors for the last 100 years, essentially? And why has laser cooling been um, uh, such a, uh, an enabling technology for our field? And the numbers, actually, from this movie pretty much alluded to exactly the point I was trying to make earlier. If you take room temperature atoms, so if you imagine trying to drop room temperature atoms onto a mirror, so I catch some room temperature atoms and I drop them. So to drop through a centimeter, it takes about 50 milliseconds. The room temperature atoms move at the speed of a jumbo jet. So in the time they drop the centimeter, they spread out to be basically the same area as, well, this lecture theater or a tennis court. Now most of us don't have labs that are the size of this lecture theater, let alone atom chips. Because these things are laser cooled, their velocity has been reduced massively. In the time it takes them to drop through a centimeter, they typically spread out to be out of the centimeter. So, okay, we miss some of the atoms, but a huge fraction of these atoms are now actually interacting with our substrate. So, again, it just shows that the physics of this experiment has been known about for a very, very long time. It's the technology of laser cooling through the door that all these things to actually be realized in the lab. So, uh, yeah, more quantitative analysis. So that there are pictures of um, fluorescence patterns um, scattering light, which is destructive. So I should point out that to, to do this, you essentially have to make an experiment, drop some atoms, shine some light, that makes them hot, collect the image, do that 10 times, then step in time. So this is a very destructive process because in order to collect all the data for the movie, it takes a very long time to try to accumulate. So we also get quantitative analysis by the atom drop through this very thin sheet of light. Um, that, so at the top, we use various um, circular states of light to change the composition of the atoms. I should point out that if, if we optically pump the atoms such that their magnetic moment is the opposite they should be strong field seekers, and that's a very dull movie, because essentially they do this and never come back. So um, it is a magnetic interaction because you can control it by controlling the internal quantum number of the atom, which is what these wave things do. And then there's this other light sheet, which we focus down to a thin sheet, and then we collect over here. And the motion of the atoms through this sheet uh, tells us something about their position and their speed. So as 
again and go through this line sheet, we see a dip in intensity. So I'm plotting the dip vertically as it were. So this is how much absorption I get as a function of time. So this is when the atoms are up the sheet, and then at about 20 milliseconds, the atoms start to come through the sheet. <coughs> then they hit the mirror, then they come back up through the sheet, and then they go away. Uh, so that's a quantitative uh, analysis of data and theory for a range of temperatures. Uh, for 77 microkelvin is too hot, the cloud gets so large that a fraction of the cloud has started to bounce and come back up as the other fraction is going down. So you don't really see a bounce. Whereas if we make the atoms colder than about 20 microkelvin, you get this very nice cloud, and then it falls through, bounces, and we measure the ratio of those two things. So the drop on the reflection, and we use the ratio of reflection to drop as a quantitative measure of our signal. So, uh, the call, we can reconfigure our mirror. So, in order to make the mirror, we've turned on this uh, kilogauss field, which has energized these domain walls. We can then annihilate these domain walls by turning on the 200 gauss field in the other direction. And that should essentially turn the mirror off, because there's no field emanating above the substrate. So, our atom chip lives uh, on the vacuum flange with these coils which allow us to um, do, uh, so there's the chip, there's the coils, and if we actually turn these coils on and off, uh, we can uh, reconfigure our atom chip uh, in real time. So essentially we see bounce signals, either they bounce or they don't, uh, and then we do five of each, five of each, five of each, and you see this um, toggled pattern so it's a single shot measurement, so you drop some atoms, you measure them, you see they bounce, and you can configure the mirror in a different way, and they don't. Uh, so we basically have 100% toggling reliability between the thing being a mirror and not. Uh, you can also interpret that in a slightly different way. So uh, 50 gauss isn't enough, oh sorry, that's 500 gauss with a million tesla because of the journal. 500 gauss isn't enough to turn it on. Uh, 1.2 kilogauss is. And clearly, there's a distribution of fields that turns it on. So that's actually an error function, which suggests that there's a Gaussian distribution of some of the parameters of these different domain walls in the chip. And we can also turn off the fields, and you see that 200 is enough, and about 100 gets you half of them, and less doesn't switch off. Now, uh, uh, colleagues of champions are particularly interested in this kind of collective behavior. So I'm interested in manipulating cold atoms with magnets, but you can turn this on its head and say we're now using cold atoms as a probe to learn about um, millions of domain walls at once. Because our chip is two millimeters by two millimeters, and there's a domain wall every micron, there's essentially a thousand by a thousand array of domain walls. So our colleagues at Sheffield don't actually have a diagnostic tool for learning what a million domain walls do at once, and our code atoms are an idea. So there are obvious questions like how wide this thing is, um, can they then, uh, what is the fundamental mechanism that gives you some jitter in whether a domain wall um, flips or not? It's a very open question for people working in um, micromagnetic simulation, and these uh, data start to offer um, some kind of insight into what's going on. So, the domain, so what you learn from that is that the domain walls are a distribution of switching fields. <coughs> Some of them might switch in one field, others will need a different field. Uh, we published that uh, earlier this year. So that was the uh, mirror idea. So let me just tell you um, briefly about the uh, atom trap idea. So now we're going back to a single domain wall and seeing what the mechanical field looks like above it. <laughs> So there's my, uh, there's my monopole again. Uh, what happens if I add the bias field? So the black line, this is distance over here above the substrate. This is magnetic field. So this is my monopole field decaying away. If I add a bias field of a certain magnitude, and I've chosen it here such that I cancel the field I get 500 millimeters. So I've added five gaps vertically down into the mirror. 
copy for the substrate, which means the five gaps that you have to be answered. And now I get this cusp like quadruple trap effect. So in this vicinity, I've now made a 3D quadrupole where again the vector nature of the field is the x component is x, the y component is y, and the z component is minus 2z. So in theory, I've now made a magnetic trap that's incredibly close to the substrate. People are very interested in the behavior of atoms very close to the substrates. So it would be nice if we could trap them out of the red and see what happens. These length scales are incredibly short, which means this gradient is incredibly large, so the trap frequency should be incredibly large. So the gradient is large, high trap frequency. However, I've just made a magnetic trap with a zero. Because the trap frequency is high, atoms are going to go through the zero very, very often, which means you don't have to wait long for some of them, all of them, to spin flip and run away. So this is potentially a disaster because I've made a trap lifetime is going to be incredibly short. So how do I circumvent these spin flip losses? Now for microscopic magnetic traps we've just seen there's a handful of ideas of how to um, circumvent them. So Yoffe, where you have a complicated set of currents and bars, could we do that? Uh, no is the short answer. Imagine you're trying to write a very complicated magnetic structure on top of each domain law that is essentially technologically unfeasible. Plug it in. So some people actually focus a laser beam to um, combine my first and second talks this morning at the center of the trap where there's a zero. If you have a laser beam to push atoms away, in theory you can then plug the zero. So it's known as a plug beam. Can we do that? No, because we have to focus the laser beam down to 10 nanometers, which is um, much too small compared to the wavelength, and to do it on an array of sites periodically. So, um, no. Uh, there's a trick known as radio field dressing where you add an oscillating field and that can uh, wash out these zeros. We look at that, and actually it relies on having gravity, so the top of the trap has a different potential than the bottom of the trap. Because our gradients are so incredibly strong, Gravity is completely negligible, so that doesn't work. The other um, technology we saw earlier was time average potential. Can we do something and move around the zero such that the atoms see the average, uh, and as a consequence, have a non-zero minimum? Uh, and yes, is the answer to that. So that looks quite promising. So can we use a time average potential? So there's our field. So the conventional way to do this would be then to add cos omega t along x, sine omega t along y, and add this oscillating potential. Like that. So it looks easy, um, but then you think about how to actually do that. Because the atoms are close to the substrate, the magnetic field is large, so you have to make a large oscillating magnetic field. Because we want the trap frequency to be large, the frequency at which you oscillate your external field has to be large. So now we're trying to find techniques to make huge currents oscillate very quickly in vacuum um, in order to make something that uh, moves around this potential and turns it into something with a non-zero minimum. Uh, and you have to satisfy these three uh, sorry, two inequalities of these three frequencies. The Lamo frequency has to be high. That's the argument that the magnetic moment has to be doing this faster than you are slowly turning it in space. And the top frequency, the frequency at which you move around these fields, have to be higher than the trap frequency that you uh, end up with. Otherwise, you have to see instantaneous zeros the other way. So it's very, very hard to do all of those because this needs a huge field. This wants to be large, so we need a large field and a large frequency. Um, and technologically, it doesn't matter if we can satisfy this if we have that point here. Uh, and it's essentially because we've got such a large trap gradient, which was the motivation for using nanowires all along. So that was slightly depressing when we realized that the big selling point of our device also seemed to be the thing stopping us from doing something. <coughs> Everyone else.
forces and in external fields which make the track zero oscillate by cancelling a field. We realize that our chip is small, the track frequencies, the gradients are high, so rather than moving a magnetic field over a substrate, why don't we leave the magnetic field where it is and move the substrate? So the idea we have, we take our second line away, and then we have motion, which is causal omega t in one direction, sine omega t in the other direction. The substrate now goes on a circular path underneath these magnetic field lines, and the net effect should be the same. So we drive cos and sine. How might you actually do that? You get piezoelectric actuators. You buy these things when they fly them for you and the flux and the only motion of the chip and top of them. Now the fact that, that we've got huge gradients actually comes into our advantage. Because these gradients are incredibly large, you only need to displace the track by hundreds of nanometers in order to make these large fields. Can you displace the actual actuators by hundreds of nanometers? Yes. That's the short answer there. So, what can be, uh, so the conventional methods are inappropriate because uh, we can't technologically do the things you need to make a time of intervention. Uh, so we're proposing to use these piezoelectric actuators to physically move the track underneath the field lines such that we get uh, time averaged potentials. This is the field you get from uh, the nanowire combined with the domain uh, bias field where you get this cusp-like behavior. If we then move the substrate around, we get a harmonic bowl where the track zero is now not, the track in minimum, sorry, is not zero, which means the atoms could then oscillate them. And that's uh, achieved by actuating this motion uh, around in the circle. So uh, all of the numbers for that actually uh, work out favorably. Uh, and you can read about the details in that paper that came out. Um, mm -hmm. So technically, uh, it's going to be much easier. Piezo devices are capacitive, so uh, you don't actually need to push a huge amount of current through a device in the vacuum, which makes that much easier. They're designed to work at very high frequencies, in fact. Um, they don't really dissipate power, which means uh, you don't heat your whole substrate. Uh, there are piezos that are uh, eminently compatible with our vacuum systems. Uh, and you can buy commercially piezos that allow you to do this two or even three dimensional motion. They're small, they're cheap, uh, they're lithographically compatible, so that we can actually write all of our um, serpentine-like wires onto the field. So the result would be a deep, idiomatic, and tight atomic trap. Uh, the nice feature of this is that uh, the thing we like about the nanowires is the very high field gradients. And this works better with high field gradients. So we turn what was our advantage and then suddenly was a disadvantage back in our field. Uh, Technically, it's going to be much easier because we don't have to worry about high currents and high powers. Uh, and actually, a nice feature is not only does it allow you to do a top drop, but if you actually look at some of the surfaces we produce, because the gradients are so large, uh, you can sample the anharmonic region of the potential and you can make a bowl, but if you push the thing even further, uh, the topology of the magnetic field minor mark turned into toroids. So in fact, you can make a nice toroidal trap. So there's much interest in trapping cold atoms in toroidal traps, because you can then imagine having super currents of atoms going round one way or the other, using them as sensors, for example. So radially, we've now got this bump, which means that the atoms go round and round. Uh, they're, uh, yes, well, sorry, the numbers are falling off. These are micro so um, 10 micro atoms could mm -hmm easily live in there. Yeah, the length scales are now hundreds of nanometers, which gives us uh, close to 100 kilohertz for track frequencies. Axially, it also is a very tough track. So we can displace the piezo uh, by 500 nanometers, uh, and then you get this very new novel um, geometry, uh, and it's quite deep, and it's quite high uh, And this is the 
there's a ratio of are the atoms actually still going round the local field before they fall out, which has to be as large as possible. Actually, it looks very favorable to the uh, So increasing the radius uh, changes the topology. Uh, and another nice feature of this is, where is the trap? The trap is um, vertically above this domain wall. But the domain walls are mobile, so you can add external fields to your nanowire and move the location of the wall. And because the wall moves, the atoms will move with them. So how do you move domain walls? Actually, pretty much anything makes them move. Magnetic field, current, stress. So there's a group at IBM, so I'll make this on their website. That, uh, so uh, this is supposed to be a magnetic nanowire. Then the red and the blue uh, represent the different um, domains, and then at an interface between red and blue is where you have the main wall. Uh, and they're interested in using this as a, a logic device. Um, and because it doesn't involve silicon, uh, long term, there are many interesting applications of um, data storage in non-silicon technology. So uh, the idea is you want some sensors here that stop to do various things you do there. And how do I get these things to move? You can either pulse current or field or physically stress the nano wire and you get motion of the wall. So the idea we have is that these walls, the atoms trapped on them, and any of the above will then cause the atoms to move around. Uh, it's some kind of reconfigurable an atom chip. So essentially you have these two regions of opposite magnetization. And for this configuration, this is where the atom um, would reside, and the that the main wall. However, if we added a magnetic field, you change the energy balance, and essentially that means this thing moves on. So uh, the vision we have is we would write um, tessellations of this kind of uh, tile, where the atoms could live very far apart, so that we could load them in with maybe an optical dipole trap. Then there'd be regions, so you could then drive the domain walls, and even if this domain wall moves faster than that one, they would both pile up and get to the top at the same time, where they would then wait, and then you would change the direction of your magnetic field and move them along again. So there are regions where the atoms are far apart or isolated, which is great for configuring the state of the atom. Then there are other regions where the atoms are very close. I mean, realistically, you probably have to make them Rydberg atoms to transiently excite and then bring them back down. And because this is a solid state technology, it's not one or two or three or four of these. I can make copies of thousands of these in an array uh, and make a very large number um, of controlled sites uh, or tough ones. So to run it just in time. So let's run some eyes all that. So an atom mirror uh, is produced by having a serpentine nanowire adding a large field perpendicular to the direction of the wire, this makes pairs of domain walls of alternating polarity. The field emanating above that is ideal for making an atom mirror. Uh, so the decaying field is what you need. Atoms bounce from this isosurface, which isn't quite flat. It's uh, slightly corrugated, but as you saw in the movie, atoms do want to so we drop them on, the reflection is diffuse, but they do work. Uh, we use a light sheet to um, also show the dynamics of the atoms, and we get uh, excellent agreement between our theory of our Monte Carlo simulation of all this and the actual experiment. We also were able to probe the micromagnetic behavior by studying the range of fields that you need to switch this device and toggle it between these two devices. So this is an example of using cold atoms as a probe of magnetic structure. Uh, for the atom trap, what we're proposing to do is use this um, monopole field, add the bias field, to make a trap. That is a zero, so the way we're going to um, circumvent that is use some time orbiting technique. Uh, the most promising one at the minute looks to be piezo actuation of motion in two orthogonal directions which would then move our substrate underneath the magnetic fields of interest, which uh, gives high traffic uh, These walls are inherently mobile. Uh, it's a 
this is the domain wall, so that's the number one here, that's the domain wall. If I add field, current, or stress, I can change the location uh, at which these items have uh, cuffed. Yeah, thanks. For the reflection on the mirror, yeah. uh, if you have a single wave function, you ideally hope to see fringes as the cloud is reflecting. Yeah. I'm guessing you'd need a VEC for that, or yeah. is that on the guards? Or? Uh, no, uh, not for us in the short term, no. Yeah. Um, so the little picture I had of a cartoon of individual atoms bouncing, it really is that. Yeah, it's not a coherent. Uh, it, yeah, it's mm -hmm. not a coherent mirror. So the uh, there's diffuse reflection, at, which essentially means the wave fronts, if you think of it as atom waves dropping onto this thing, yeah. do get corrugated. Yeah. Okay. So there's two things that you need to do. You need to start with a better source of coherent matter waves, which would be the BEC. But and even that's then, that's yeah. surely doable, right? That, yeah, that's doable. Yeah, yeah. But um, you wouldn't see nice. Um, fraction patterns or fringes because of the corrugation of the okay. So essentially, uh, if you want to make an atom mirror, there are far better ways of doing it than this, is the short answer to that. We did this because it actually demonstrated the technology, and there's this toggling between the on off uh, that we haven't seen before, and the idea that we could use a macroscopic cloud of code atoms. Because at some level, yeah, I mean, um, the obvious question is why are we dropping these things from a centimeter at all? wouldn't we be far better off with the atoms just on the chip? And that's actually where we really want to. I mean, yeah, it's just convenient for us to start with some code atoms physically displaced. And then the obvious experiment to do was a mirror experiment. But the real long-term future would be to start with code atoms, probably the BEC, <coughs> on or normally close to the substrate. Because our problem at the minute is we've actually got to dissipate that much of kinetic energy uh, gained from that potential. Current carrying wires, yeah, that's yeah, that's right. So if, if you if you so in our uh, mirror, there, there is no current; it's a permanent magnet. So I suppose that the good thing about that is it doesn't need current. Exactly. Really yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, one of the experiments I mentioned was uh, Peter Hannaford was the pioneer of this um, technology, wiping structures with current carrying wires and pulsing what is actually incredibly large current fraction of an atom through something that's incredibly thin and in vacuum. If you do it for a short amount of time, it doesn't work. Do those, do those permanent structures, do they tend to wear out with these magnets? No, no, it's, no. Um, yeah, magnets are incredible. They just sit there, just emanating magnetic field, as if there's kilo amps per square centimeter running through them, but there isn't, well, there isn't a battery. The Q temperature is very high, so we can take these things out in vacuum and nothing actually goes wrong. The, the, the lifetime of these ground states, they're, they're technically metastable, but they're infinitely longer than anything else in our experiment. Yeah, if you calculate, so the, yeah, this field profile uh, as a function of um, uh, X and Y above the wire just doesn't change. I mean, there are issues with the fact that, uh, well, so some of the issues are the way I've drawn it there, that's sort of this is perfectly smooth, and real ones aren't smooth which means that some of these norths and sets don't quite have the same strength, et cetera. That's essential. But if you have a current carrying wire, the wire also has edges, and people have seen the degradation of atom chip experiments from the edges of wires, so it's the same kind of argument, actually. One, actually, one of the issue is if you try and get your atoms closer and closer to the substrate, the fact that so the current carrying wire chips, then there's an awful lot of metal and metal actually radiates black body radiation. Mm -hmm. These atoms tend to be heated or spin flipped by the radiation from the metal. So one nice feature of this is that 100 nanometers wide of metal, and then there's 0.9 microns of silicon. So actually there isn't that much metal. So the um, 
black body field with the fluctuations above this thing, uh, much smaller than the current carrying wire devices. So that was actually one of the big um, theoretical questions about 10 years ago. What is the field above a metal surface? Uh, and in that Zimmerman and the book I will be one highlighted, and they have a large section on that where people actually try and calculate um, what is the near field what are the fluctuations from the fact that you've got currents in metals uh, and it's actually a limiting factor for many atom chip experiments as to how long the atoms live. 